Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter. And I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Oh my Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at Collective Con that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now and I'll see you at Collective Con, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. Ladies and gentlemen. I present to you the short box. Yo, Short Box Nation. Hello, what's up? How you been? And welcome back. And of course, a friendly hello to all of our new listeners joining us for the first time. It's nice to have you tuning in today. This is episode 283, and I'm your host, Botter Milligan. I'll be spearheading this episode solo today, but worry not. You'll hear the voices from the usual crew, Cesar, Ed, and Ashley, next week for our Frank Frazetta Spotlight episode. If this is your first time tuning in, might I recommend checking out our previous episode, episode 282, Big and Cool. I had the opportunity to interview Thomas Tenney, a comic book artist who has been working in the industry for almost 35 years. He shared stories from his time at companies like Marvel, Image, DC, and even that time he worked on a project with ACDC. That episode is available now. I want to thank all the listeners who submitted emails recently. We'll read those in our next episode when we get the crew back together. And last but not least, a sincere thank you goes out to all of our Short Box patrons for their contributions. This show would not be possible without your support. Thank you for your help in keeping the lights on here at Short Box Studios. It is appreciated by all of us. For our new friends with us today, if you're interested in access to bonus episodes, unreleased interviews, and merchandise, visit patreon.com slash the short box for more information on becoming a Short Box patron. Short Box Nation, as many of you know by now, Last week, an announcement was made by Steve Geppi, founder of Diamond Comics Distributors, the comic industry's largest and arguably a monopolistic distributor, that there will be no new comic shipments for the foreseeable future due to the current epidemic. For those unaware, Diamond transports comic books and graphic novels from both big and small comic book publishers to retailers worldwide, as well as other pop culture products such as toys, games, and apparel. This announcement arrived at a time when comic shops across the nation are in the midst of dealing with the impacts caused by COVID-19, like many other small businesses. We're talking about a noticeable disruption to normal operations that has put many of these shops in less than ideal positions to safely sell comic books and merchandise to bring in revenue to keep their shops afloat. I can only fairly speak about the shops I've personally seen here in Jack's that have valiantly maneuvered through the stressful situation, but I hope many of you listening right now can echo the same sentiment I have when it comes to your local comic shop, which is the real-life superheroes doing the best they can for all of us that value that escapism that we get in new weekly physical comics and the community around it. To help me discuss in greater detail what Diamond's recent announcement means to local comic shops and how it impacts you as a consumer and what you can possibly do to support your favorite shop and comic industry in these challenging times, I invited Jonathan Bates as today's special guest. Jonathan is the owner of Altered Egos Comic Shop located in Orange Park, Florida, as well as the host of the Altered Egos Comics podcast. Two things I highly recommend you check out if you're a local or if you're searching for another awesome comic-related podcast. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for joining us today. 
Hey, Barter. How you doing, man? So uh, starting with the, the Gephi, uh sort of announcement, I think that there's a lot that could could be read into it. But I think the most important thing to, to read into it is that Gepi and Diamond's position as the sole distributor of weekly comic books, weekly periodical comic books, hmm. uh, they're not making that decision lightly. I think that they're they're making that decision because also with that uh, with that announcement, he said anything that we have already in our warehouses, anything that we have uh, backlog, any comics that had come out before April first, mm-hmm. order those and we will ship them to you. So what that tells you is, the, and he says, as long as the warehouse is open. So. Maryland actually today, which is where one of the diamond warehouses is at, got a mandatory non-essential shutdown order. Hmm. So I'm assuming that that's going to um, – some of those shutdown orders in different states, if you want to have some real fun and get into some dark places, uh, you can read how these shut ha- shutdown uh, orders are worded. And a lot of them, there's a loophole for warehouses, which in this case diamond you know, can qualify as. And so they may still be able to ship from there. But – the big deal with that was it wasn't that they were deciding not to ship. It was they weren't going to have product to ship. And, you know, that means the, lar- the larger down chain uh, effects, probably most likely the printers for both Diamond or for DC and Marvel were shutting down. And at the point that they did that, you know, then the whole flow of weekly comics get disrupted and, you know, um, as much as I'd like to say, you know, it was nice for them to finally say something, the fact that um, there wasn't an in-depth, you know, an in-depth understanding as to why. Uh, hmm. The when question with this is very difficult to answer. As to when will this end? I don't know. The The virus hasn't consulted me <laughs> on this. Uh, <laughs> I really wish it did. It's just not yeah. taking my emails. I don't know. I feel like I'm being ghosted. Uh, yeah, but it's... it's... The, the, the virus is definitely working at its at its own timetable and schedule, and uh, as different as bad as it is, as different states issue these these uh, these shutdowns, that does bring us closer to getting back to normal. Because you know it's going to take two weeks of isolation plus an additional two weeks for anybody that got it while they were in isolation, and this just for funsies, two weeks on either side of that just as a safety measure. So. You're talking at whatever point that the the daily increase of numbers here in the U.S. start to go down, start counting two months from that. Hmm. Right now, they've remained flat at about 15%, 15% more new cases every day. So un- until – I mean, I wish my bank account would compound 15% <laughs> daily. Uh, <laughs> don't it, we all, buddy? Just, don't we all? Yeah, don't we all? Uh, certainly, right now, I would very much wish my bank account was was uh, compounding fifteen percent daily. Because, uh, again, my shop, and I, I don't think that I'm completely alone in this. Uh, judging by the chatter mm-hmm. uh, from different retailers and the the struggle and scramble to do something, we rely on those weekly readers. We rely on those weekly shipments of comics, and you know, here we are. So, so John, what what about the? Because I mean, Diamond doesn't just only dabble in, in you know w- weekly comics. But what about? Do you think this announcement also includes their other merch like toys, statues, and apparel? Does it impact that at all? I think it's going to impact some of them. They haven't stated hmm. as such. And apparel have a longer lead time uh, with these things, and a lot of those uh, tend to come from overseas, which you see those areas uh having the issues and impacts that they that they are hmm. uh if you ever take the time to look into uh you know like the trade paperbacks uh, that you purchased if you look at the printing on it a lot of them will say printed in prc that's the people's republic of china hmm. so you know trades have a different release schedule than uh you know than than floppies i i know that there are some uh, comics that are printed in China. There's also some that are printed in Canada. Uh, there are a few that are printed here at smaller presses within the United States. Uh, the whole thing just kind of illustrates it's not just 
you know, it's not these big names like we know. Oh, it's DC Comics. Now, DC doesn't do any of their own printing. Marvel doesn't do any of their mm-hmm. own printing. True. And, you know, all, we all understand that all their creators are diverse and dispersed around the country, you know, in Brazil, Europe, everywhere. But so is a lot of their other business aspects. And even if, even if Diamond were removed from the picture and if they weren't the pinch point in this, you'd still have those other pieces of the supply chain to look at. And, you know, there's, there's still a lot of noise and speculation as to, you know, how do we get around this? And it's like, well, first you've got to find a printer that could handle the volume, Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) you know, and it's also got to be something that's got to be, I think, just me talking here. I I think it's not to be something, a solution that has to be more industry wide. If DC came back, but Marvel and Image didn't, you know, that that wouldn't be a, a good and healthy solution if, you know, if, you know, Marvel and Dark Horse came back, but no one else did, that wouldn't be a healthy solution. So whatever printing solution that they find, it has to be uh, big enough to handle the industry. And then from, and it'd probably be a consortium of printers, you know, more more likely. From there, you'd have to find shippers to to get it someplace. And, sh- and you know, part of the beauty of Diamond, if you will, is that all the comics flow into one place and then go out to the, you know, 2,500, 3,000 different uh, comic stores. You're not going to want to have, you're not going to want to have uh, printers printing and shipping. You want to have shippers shipping, printers printing, and, you know, those type of things. And you certainly don't want shippers making 3,000 different shipments for this. I mean, it's uh, it's just all going to be some kind of mess. <laughs> So, so it almost sounds like you answered what, one of my outstanding questions when it came to, to this news. Because at, at first, the way I interpreted it was that the distribution would cease, but they were going to print um, uh, the, the weekly titles as it is and then would just kind of uh, do some sort of um, whatever, just one massive release and then have you know all the books that the shops are missing by the time it comes out. I mean, I mean is, or, or is it the case of even the printers? I don't think... Yeah, I, 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 there were a lot of people, and I was among them. Of, hmm, okay. of, you know, because there's no, I want them to have, start having a conversation of not necessarily when, but what. What does it look like, whether it's two months from now or six months from now? <clears throat> what does it look like when we come out of this and come on out to the other side of it? You know, and I think that again, a lot of people have a fear of, oh well, if it's been two months, if it's been six months, we're going to compress you know, for Marvel and DC, all the books that were supposed to come out as much as possible so that we can get back on to whatever arbitrary schedule uh, that they did. And I think that that is not a realistic solution for anybody. Uh, it's not a, it's not ultimately a realistic solution for the end consumer. You know, if, if we were gone for six months, you show your up and then like, here's the six months of books you were on poll for. And uh, I'd like to get paid today. Yeah, hmm. you, know, you combine that with the fact that a lot more and more people every day are going to be out of work and having to make, you know, financial decisions. You know, if you were to come out of this, you know, as, you know, just average Joe Schmo and, you know, you're you're trying to figure out how to, you know, keep your lights on and keep food in the, in the fr- fridge and you go to the comic shop because, yay, things are going back to normal and the shop's open and then they they plump down, you know, you're you're on poll for four titles. Here they are. Here's six months worth of them. <laughs> not a realistic solution. And also logistically, it's not a realistic solution. <clears throat> you take uh, you take these books and you try running them through the printer. You know, the, it, it takes time for books to be printed and assembled and for ink to dry and, and all, all these types of things. Uh, I, I don't think that they could they could keep up with that. Shops financially could not handle it especially having been in a cool down period for as long as we will be it's like, I won't be capitalized to be able to take advantage of that. Even if, you know, uh, diamond DC Marvel and the others are offering us, you know, terms hmm. and uh, discounts and things like that. <clears throat> it's, it's going to be, it's going to have to be week to week. The next book that comes out from DC needs to be Batman 92. Yep. And then Batman 93 shouldn't come out for another month 
you know, after that. It should go back to whatever point we start, we go on that schedule, not a compressed schedule. I was reading um, something, I think it was on uh, uh, comics.com or um, Bleeding Cool or something, and they brought up how with what is it, Batman 92, it's going to be the first appearance of um, Punchline on a cover. And they were talking right. about the possibility or concerns that they've seen from retailers about um, that book. I guess it was still whenever they were trying to decide, well, is, it going to, is this going to be the last physical book by DC or is it going to be strictly digital? But one of the concerns that I read regarding if it would come out physical would be um, uh, consum- or fans that are anxiously looking for this issue um, going you know, above and beyond to try to find a shop that has this um, issue, whether it's in their city or in a different city or uh, just just kind of disobeying or uh, overlooking any safety concerns when it comes to, you know, being outside and, you know, b- being in contact with people. I thought that was a pretty, um, well, I mean, it was kind of like one of those, like, ah, oh, damn it. Well, it's bleeding cool, like so, you know, you can only take so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah true, true. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blowhard, and I only know as much as I, I think I know, but Rich John a whole different creature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, Batman 92, uh, you know, when, when it comes out, those, those books have, the, the question is when it comes to things like FOC, final order cutoff, uh, Batman 92 had already been FOC. So as far as DC comics knows, they already know what they're going to sell for Batman 92 because all the shops have already put in, you know, their order requests for these. Now, what what needs to happen is when this comes back, it's like either you ship me what I originally ordered or we re FOC mm-hmm. and we start over again. You know, you give me kind of some kind of warning that, hey, the numbers have gone down to accept to a level we plan to, to ship again in three weeks. We need you to re FOC our books. Well, if it's been two months, I probably maybe, maybe, hopefully, Jesus, hopefully have still most of my customers. If it's six, I've got to reevaluate what my order is. You know, even if it is Batman, even if it is Punchline, even if it is the first cover experience, uh, cover shot from this. I mean, our, our guys at Art Germ are doing uh, a custom cover for that. You've got to, you've got to really seriously reevaluate all that, even if it is something like Punchline that everybody wants. Mm-hmm. At this point, everybody wants, so- and you know, people may still want it. But if you're going to be, again, making that choice between, you know, rent and comics, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure comics are going to lose out. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, in the real t- uh, the, the retailer world and among, like, your colleagues, I mean, as, I imagine there's been a lot of brainstorming for alternate solutions in the interim. I mean, have, have you been privy to any of that conversation or have you seen any solutions proposed by other, you know, comic shops that, that seem feasible? Well, okay. So, yes, there have been, com- there have been concepts conversations about that but the problem with it is that uh the big two are not participating yeah in those conversations so we can make plan of the world we could probably even find a printer that could handle the volume somehow and dc and and uh and marvel are not you know a part of those conversations some other retailers uh or i'm sorry other uh publishers publishers Hmm. smaller publishers uh aftershock uh boom uh, the the likes of these uh, Black Mass, TKO, Vault, yeah. Scout, TKO, you know they're they're doing things like if you know if people buy their books online and they name the the comic shop that they would uh, normally go to that they would um, they would give fifty percent of the proceeds yep. uh, to that shop and you know hey that's a great thing but it, that's not Marvel saying that and even if Marvel did say it. Marvel doesn't have the books. These guys, again, are smaller publishers, smaller printers. Uh, they, they've they got the books to send out for these people. And in a lot of these things, I think that, for example, like TKO, TKO, uh, you know, offers you, you know, the whole thing soup to nuts, you mm-hmm. know, uh, as far as like, uh, you know, digital and, and, the old, and the whole thing there is reading closely. I don't know how many of these really are digital offerings and, you know, eventually – you're not going to see the print offerings from these guys. I, I don't know. I haven't looked that deeply into it because, again, hey, it's great and it's crappy the way that the big two have been treating us. But the truth of the matter is as the big two go, so goes the rest of the industry. Hmm. So at the point where they stop 
printing comics. We here in America, at least, we're still a very much a superhero comic culture. And without without those guys in it, uh, yeah, the the industry would, would is definitely in a bad place. So, I mean, have you had any publishers uh, aside from like some of their public statements? And to your point, um, outside of the big two, it does seem the likes of like Archie, Boom, Dark Horse, IDW, they're they're all kind of standing strong, in my opinion, with, with you know the retailers and the comic shops and saying, hey, you know, we're not going to release our digital stuff until um, the uh, physical uh, publications resume. I mean, have any of these shops like personally kind of reached out or provided more information that they haven't, you know, uh, made available to like the general public? Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Short Box Store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code YO, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. Not uh, not to be. The, the closest thing is that I've gotten is, you know, personal emails from uh, the CEO and owners of, uh, you know, Vault and Scout and, and all of these others, basically TKO, you know, saying that, you know, following basically TKO's lead that this is, you know, this is what they're going to be offering. But, you know, again, they are, they, I, I appreciate that. I really do. But they, they do represent a, a fractional big mm-hmm. piece of, you know, the overall, uh, you know, industry. So- um, but, we're still waiting, you know, for, you know, for DC to say something, for Marvel to to say something, and unfortunately, it uh, it hasn't happened yet, and nor nor do I think it's going to happen uh, anytime very soon, uh, as, because I, I don't know that I don't know we we don't know exactly why that they're shut down, and we're forced to surmise it was because of a printer disruption. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't a diamond disruption. Diamond's still willing to ship. Um, you know, the the talent, you know, we haven't heard, you know, Tom King say that he's got, yeah. you know, the coronavirus and can't write anymore. So it's not that, which, you know, leaves you to the printing of physical copies. And on that particular note, there's a lot of retailers that are really scared about the whole digital response. And I think it's great that, you know, Marvel and DC at this point aren't, uh, you know, continuing their publishing schedule on on digital. But the truth of the matter is, is digital is less than five percent of the market. And I think even with uh, even with what we've got going on here now, they will continue to be less than five percent of the market uh, as far as what people are purchasing. I mean, the av- my experience with the the average digital person in in our shop is that they buy digital to try it. They buy digital uh, if it, uh, you know, they're traveling or something, but they're at their heart, they're collectors and they like the physical copy. So that ultimately is where we are. I mean, so many things, I mean, even, even in the heart of uh, what's going on with the coronavirus right now, the response of a lot of businesses, those that can work from home are, even those that had traditionally been uh, resistant to that are looking at remote and work from home opportunities whenever possible so that they can have continuity of business. Hmm. And that's the way of the world, right? That's the way everything's going, you know, where people have been making more online digital choices, but comics are kind of something of a misnomer. Comics are still a very tactile experience. People like to feel their comic. 
you know, it, it's there's so many different aspects to comic book, comic booking, if you will, from, you know, reading to collecting, you know, people that follow authors, people that only look at covers, uh, you know, people that yeah, enjoy risque things or, you know, cool storytelling. I mean, just all these different things comes down to the printed media of ink to paper. And, you know, until that particular issue gets solved, uh, we're not going to get any new issues. That point became very relevant for me when I was trying to explain the, uh, when I had to kind of hear myself back, explain what this, how this impacts, like, you know, comic book collecting as a whole in the industry. Because uh, cause the, um, the person I was talking to just couldn't wrap their head around, well, there's a digital solution, right? Why not just release all the comics digitally? And I was like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Like, you know, we, there is a vast market for physical and, and there's a, you know, a whole, you know, culture to going into the shop and, you know, being around like-minded folks and checking out the new books, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, it wasn't until I kind of had to like talk it through. I was like, man, like, yeah, this is, this is a very niche market that's still for some, I think on the outside looking in, you could be like, well, that's kind of like behind the curve. It's like, no, no, no. It's a very, it's ingrained in a culture that like you've kind of got to be a part of when we were uh, I was recently listening to some old episodes and I was listening to our hip hop uh, podcast episode <laughs> yeah, yeah and good episodes <laughs> and you know I know that uh, when we when we spoke about that you, you at the time were looking to get you know certain covers to actually use them as wall art mm-hmm. you know I mean can you imagine getting you know the digital versions of these covers and just you know you know, hanging, you know, iPads all over your house uh, to, to 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 show them off. I mean, <laughs> you'd be straight balling at that point. I mean, yeah, you, know, yeah, you got a huge amount of money. Exactly. Like, wow, he's got 20 covers on his wall. Are those 20 iPads? Good yeah. God, man. Looking like a hospital, like a fancy-ass yeah. hospital. <laughs> hmm. I mean, that, and it's because of things like that, you know, because they do have a cover. Mm-hmm. You know, that uh, that I think that, you know, that is one of the one of the big features to, you know, collectability. The the story that that's, you know, that's in there are, you know, more and more of this is like this is what this is what people want out of this. And, you know, unfortunately, we're we're not in a position to, to really be able to uh, to address them with it. So I want to get back to to big, to the big two, because, I mean, to, to your point, they will drive i think i mean already you know their sales already drive so much of the comic industry and we did we have highlighted you know some of the good things that some of the smaller publishers are doing in support of you know retailers and local comic shops and doing the best they can um but but concerning like the big two of marvel and dc i know what i know thus far is marvel hasn't really announced anything formal other than hey we're going to give some very deep discounts um, to the yeah. products uh, that we're selling now, which is kind of, I guess, maybe in my opinion, Except, a mute point at this moment. Well, exactly. That's kind of like the, it's like yeah. kind of like my same point with the digital thing. When when they said, "Hey, you know, we're not going to release these digitally," because they know that you know they're not going to capture that much damn mm-hmm. money. It's not like there's going to be a straight conversion to uh, to people buying. Oh well, I was buying this, you know, last week at at Alter Egos. I'll just get it online now. Some people are going to do that because some people do want to know what the next story is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to DC's point from a from both a goodwill point and from a, uh, you know, for both Marvel and DC from a, you know, a point of goodwill and you know just a point of economics. It's like releasing Batman 92 digitally is not going to make them any money. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, this actually releasing it digitally and then releasing it in print when they can might actually hurt them in the long run because again i even if it is even if it does the absolute very best and let's let's just let's be really let's be really positive for whatever damn reason here and say that they went digital <laughs> and they managed to go from 5% to 50% that they were they were managed to capture 50% of the people when they decide it's time to come back for this and they want the rest of the money that they should have got, you know, from, from these digital, from these sales and they release the print version. Now it's not original. It was previously, you know, uh, you know, previously released digitally, Hmm. originally released digitally. There'd have to be a note 
somewhere in the, uh, you know, the comic shop buyer's guide that Batman 92 originally released digitally. It was first released digitally. And again, for the collector mentality, Marvel does this a lot. They'll take some of their original digital material and they'll release it uh, in print for the first time. They'll say that in print for the first time, originally released digitally. Those titles do not tend to do as well as a title that was first released in print. At my shop, and some people say it's because it was released digitally and those people already have it. At my shop, most of my customers do not tend to be digital customers. So I'm kind of an outlier in this in that I can I can sell books that were released first digitally. But for for the big two and their big books, not gonna happen. Just I, I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think it can happen. Not because it's physically possible, you know, impossible. I just think that Ultimately, you know, the only color that really matters in this country is green, hmm. and there's not going to be whether that green is digital or paper. You know, <laughs> they're not going to they're not going to make as much as they would have if they just wait to release it first down in paper. So, what about uh, some of the other things? Because um, I know with DC, it's a little multifaceted. I mean, they they're offering what uh, fully returnable. Uh, all their comics are fully returnable from March 18th to June 24th. Um, another thing I've seen a lot of in, in the last two days is how they're looking for alternate methods of shipping comics to stores, um, even as far as maybe even no. using it. See, there, you got to read that, read that again and read that closely. They're offering alternate methods for readers. Hmm. They don't mention stores. Yes, yep, that's one thing I've, I've, um, I've seen um, spotlight. And to, to most of the retailers that read closely on that, you know, they they're thinking, oh, well, that that means digital, and I'm like, it it could very well, but again, for the reasons that I outlined, I don't think uh, you know, digital is a is a good solution for them. Is going to be a a solution that makes them money in the long run. And I think isn't it true that they're also, at least from DC's perspective, they're planning to release digital comics as scheduled or at least if not all of them but a, a select few right uh i think the only ones that they plan to release on schedule were the ones that were going to be uh digital first or digital only so hmm. like take a book like injustice injustice has traditionally yep. always been a digital first comic mm-hmm. and uh then they release in print and the part of the reason is that is because your standard comic is like 22 pages and i've i've had customers tell me that the Injustice books, when they're released, don't like necessarily follow that 22-page format. Yeah, really so short. it might take three or four issues of a digital Injustice book to actually equal one issue that we would sell on the newsstand. Yep. I remember reading those digitally and um, uh, when they were coming out weekly. And the number formatting was really weird when I ended up buying them in physical. Because I was like, wait a minute. This is like, yeah. you guys crammed this many? Okay, that makes sense. So I think those books, books that were already digital first, I think that they will continue to do those. But, you know, again, you're not going to see your Batman 92. You're not going to see Flash. You're not going to see Generation 1. Uh, you're, you're not going to see these titles coming out uh, from them. I could be very well wrong. And it's like I, I often am wrong, and I'm wrong about a lot of things. But, again, for the reasons that I outlined, I just I just don't see this. Uh, I, I see it ultimately being a bad PR thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, in, in all honesty, I was, um, like I said, I was, I was going through some articles today, and um, a few of them had highlighted, um, of course, you know, select a handful of comments from uh, retailers on discussion boards, and they were really going at DC for this, um, for their plan of releasing digitally without print. I mean, there's, there was just a lot of scathing uh, comments towards DC, you know, things like, you know, they're, ruin, they're going to ruin the industry and, you know, how, you know, this is how they support the local comic shops, you know? Yeah, a lot of that is what we're seeing uh, online from, uh, you know, in the, the various uh, boards that are that we're in. Uh, I actually got, you know, uh, you know, email from uh, a member of the, the DC uh, PR and marketing staff to just basically say, you know, we're continuing to talk about the problem. We will be making more announcements in the coming days and weeks. Hmm. Uh, and that's, that's the thing with this is while the, 
you know, the retailers are, you know, up in arms about this. You know, it's a lot of corporate doublespeak, and there hasn't really anything been definitively said. Uh, so, you know, I'm, so so I guess I, I love I love to spoil for a good fight as much as the next guy, <laughs> but at this point. You're not really helping anybody. Yeah. So, I mean, short of, because, I mean, I think everyone's waiting on, you know, what's going to be Marvel's stance, what's going to be their final response. I mean, short of saying, hey, we found another printer that'll, you know, uh, um, support our needs and, you know, we can just figure out a different distribution. I mean, is there any solution for Marvel to come out as a good guy or or lead the way or just do something completely different? Oh, I think it definitely could. If they could find somebody to handle their weekly load of books, and I think then if they went, if they went back in and cut down uh, some of their titles, let's let's say that they cut out or put on hold or hiatus any title that was selling. Well, let's let's just let's put an arbitrary number: less than fifty thousand copies a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if, if they if they did that and only took, you know, 50,000 and above and say, you know, these are the books that were this is the slate that we're going to do. And there's enough room in our printer for, you know, this many other titles if you guys want to come along. And I think that they could definitely, whether it's Marvel or DC or a cooperation between them two, they could definitely be spun as the heroes uh, with this. However, there is another problem. Um, you're aware of the list, the list, <laughs> the the list of, of accounts that was leaked in late December. Oh, um, I remember vaguely about it, but I mean, feel free to, to go into detail about that. Okay, so there was a list that got leaked by a Diamond Associate, and it went out to some accounts. I was unfortunately not one of them. As a numbers guy, <laughs> I would have loved to have seen this. But it was a list Darn. of – this was when Marvel – it was at the end of the year, and Marvel was going to be double-shipping books to shops for um, for Christmas and New Year's or Christmas and the week before Christmas. And we were going to have those books all at once so that we could uh, we could then sell them. And so you had to make your FOC orders early and bigger and all this crap. And as they sent this reminder out, one of the associates attached – an Excel spreadsheet that had the list of every, every a Marvel account and, you know, like sales numbers, contact data, all of this. Wow. And it was basically the, it was confirmation of a number of accounts that, you know, Diamond is always very cagey about the number of accounts that actually are serviced by Diamond. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, here, here you were. Here was some uh, some confirmation. The people that did get it uh, did some crunching on it. Brian Hibbs, uh, check out Brian Hibbs on Tilting at Windmills. He keeps a he runs a monthly article called uh, semi monthly uh, called Tilting at Windmills, and he did a breakdown and analysis of it. And you know, you're able to find things like how many buying clubs and things like that are actually out there. Uh, because he was looking at the number of active accounts that were like in his personal area. He's like, I know all the shops in my area. Who the hell are these six guys? <laughs> hmm. You know, so there are a lot of, there was a lot there on like that, like that. Well, since this has all happened, some, some of the people that have the list have done a new analysis of the list, uh, matching it up with, uh, mandatory state closures. And at this point, well over 50% of the accounts are closed, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, some people are lucky enough, like we are here locally to be doing curbside and shipping. Some aren't even allowed to do that, Hmm. uh, in, in some States. So over 50% of the accounts on that are in some type of thing. So even if Marvel were to make an announcement and say, Hey, we're going to start shipping books in a month. There are some, there are some shops and locations that wouldn't be able to take advantage of it. So that's the other thing about this is you you have to wait to, and I don't know what that critical number is or that critical mass, but you have to wait until there is some critical number or mass of these stores that are actually open again that can receive product. You know, so even if you offer all the discounts in the world, even if you send it to some of these shops free, if there's no one there to pick it up, you know, what what good does it do? Hmm. And these are these are big, you know, like Denver. 
you know, like the city of Col- or the state of Colorado, you know, has some big time shops there. They're under a, you know, mandatory, you know, sort of shutdown sort of thing. <clears throat> California is, you know, is like that. Different municipalities there are, are like that. So it seems to be like the, the biggest. Luckily, you know, Governor DeSanity has decided that he's never going to shut down Florida. So we can still potentially uh, receive product. But, you know, he does have the, the FHP out there uh, patrolling the borders for uh, any rogue New York or New Jersey uh you know, uh, refugees trying to come to Florida. <laughs> Enemy of the state number one, snowbirds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. M- meanwhile, you know, meanwhile, there's a, there's a ship getting ready to dock oh in Fort God, Lauderdale that, that uh, has four dead on board, 53 others with the symptoms. But we're going to let that in. The, the cruise ship, yeah, we're going to let the New Yorkers, those guys are filthy. Yeah, it's a Disney cruise ship. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, it's the John, happiest place on earth, Jonathan. What measures has as um your shop Altered Egos uh, taken thus far? I mean, when it comes to servicing customers and you know making sure that you guys get some sales or whatnot. I mean, what what have you guys done so far? So for the 18th, uh, for New Comic Book Day on the 18th, we decided, uh, looking at the state and looking at the way that the numbers were trending, that we would take the same measures that we saw some other shops in other states doing. And uh, so we practiced uh, social distancing. So we, at that point, uh, we were only allowing 10 people in to the sh- into the shop uh, for a maximum of 10 people. And that included Josh and Hank. Mm. Um, Hank so counts as two. Hank, Hank the dog. Hank is, listening. yeah, Hank's the dog. Hank's a big dog. It, Hank takes up a lot of room. So what we were, what we were doing at that point was practicing social distancing. I've got approximately a thousand square foot store when you factor in fixtures and everything 10 was a very safe uh, and conservative number that everybody could still maintain uh, distance from each other. Uh, however, as the numbers continued to grow and uh, we started to move on into the next phase of this for the, for the new comic book day on February 25th, uh, we extended it to the point we would just not have anybody in the store. So we offered curbside pickup. Uh, we're offering curbside pickup on Wednesdays and Saturdays on, uh, Thursdays and Fridays, we're doing a limited range personal delivery. So if you're in, uh, Fleming Island, Orange Park, Middleburg, or the Oakleaf area of Jacksonville, uh, we will deliver for a flat $5 fee. Uh, um, to take advantage of any of these, you just send us an email, request an invoice. We send the invoice. As soon as as soon as you pay that, we're off to the races. And uh, then uh, we also offer shipping for a flat dollar, a flat five dollar fee as well. So if you're not in the state, we've had a few people reached out to us uh, from Georgia and the like that uh, you know want uh, want books uh, from oh, yeah. us. So we're we've sent out a lot of invoices. <laughs> Uh, that's what we've uh, we've been doing at at this point. Uh, so, for next week, next week being uh, you know New Comic Book Day or I, whenever this you you put this together to air. So for April Fools, uh, which the the jokes. The oh, the jokes irony is not lost on me. Be fucking epic. <laughs> you know this. You know it, dude. Punchline. Come on. It's like never, never in our lives have we depended so much on the internet and never in our lives that we needed to stay away from it as much as we need to next Wednesday. Well said. But, uh, what we're going to be doing over there is like, we don't have new books, but we understand. I mean, uh, my niece and nephew, uh, go to school in Duval County and they have been home since, uh, spring break. So spring break happened, uh, and then they were told, Hey, we're going to extend spring break another week. And then after while well, we figure out what to do, and then after that, it was, uh, you know, we're going to be doing uh, distance learning or e-learning mm-hmm. or online learning, uh, you know, type of options. So they're, you know, deeply involved in that. And like you were saying at the beginning of this, you know, it's a little going a little stir crazy. So Josh is putting together um, a methodology that uh, he's, it's kind of like a Chinese menu sort of thing, you know, a little column A, a little column B, you mm-hmm. select a gender, an age range. And then I think he's going with like salsa 
you know, so mild, medium, hot, muy caliente, day of the dead <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, for like ten dollars, he'll put the put together a grab bag of books. And uh, you know, so you if you have a couple of kids and you uh, you know want them to share, or a couple of kids and you want to get different things, or hey, if just you maybe you want to try something that uh, you know that you missed out before, I think there's a great opportunity. Uh, for that, and we're going to be doing that as well as continuing to service, uh, you know, those co- customers that haven't come in in the last couple of weeks mm. uh, to to get books, you know, while we uh, while we have them. I want to I want to break the, the the fourth wall here real quick and just address the listeners real quick. The, there is a reason why I reached out to um, Jonathan regarding this this topic. He's got this uncanny mutant ability of talking the business of of, of making in layman's term the business side of comic books and what it means to own a comic shop, but also him and Josh both have this great ability to recommend stellar comic book, just comic books in general to anyone. And Jonathan, this is where um, I, I mean to give you an overdue compliment. Uh, Brian Brumley, who I introduced you at our uh, Comic Swap and Hip Hop event in November, um, right. I introduced you to, uh, you recommended that he check out uh, Claws by uh, Grant Morrison. Well, we had him. Oh, yeah. We had him on the show. I think a month or two after that, and it was just basically just a ke- catch up with him. You know, he had started collecting comic books. I think a, a few weeks prior to that event and meeting you, and that was one of the questions I asked. Was you know, um, hey, how'd you like Claws, by the way? And uh, he had nothing but praises to sing. He said, you know, at first I was, you know, like what a book about Santa Claus? What the hell? And he said he read he read the comic that you gave him, and he said I immediately ordered the nicest hardcover that I could find. And I was like, "Yep, that's jo- that's Jonathan Bates for you in, in a nutshell." When it comes to comic books, he cannot steer you wrong. When I, I like to go to a steakhouse in Orlando called uh, Charlie's, and uh, they they serve just absolutely the best steak. Uh, it's something to do every time I'm there. I mean, they they will sell you an absolutely fork tender. 20 ounce sirloin. I mean, it's just amazing. And I'll tell people, you know, here that, you know, hey, I'm thinking of going to Charlie's this weekend. And they'll say, oh, yeah, you, where's that? It's out in Orlando. It's like, you're going to go to Orlando? Yeah, I'm just going to drive down there. You're just going to drive down today? <laughs> For the steak, it's like, yeah, yeah, drive down, come back. It's like two and a half hours. Yeah, and then about two and a half, three hours to have the dip. Two and a half, three hours. So two and a half, three hours to get there. Two and a half, three hours while you're there. And then two and a half, three hours back. We're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for those people that, you know, have been out with me before, you know, it's it's like you know, they they go kind of work it this way. It's like, well, if you're gonna if you're willing to commit, you know, nine hours to a steak, that's a steak I want to eat. You know, and it's like other people like that's just pure insanity. So when you when you tell somebody, oh yeah, Klaus, it's 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 Santa Claus year one. It's fucking awesome. And they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's like, I don't know. He seems really serious about it. (laughs) It, It's just wacky enough. It might work. Let me try it. Yeah. When when he, when he, I remember, I remember that comic swap event. I gave, I gave that book to him. And when I could tell him, he's he's like, yep. The hesitance. You know, Botter just talked him up and, you know, Torres talked him up. And now here he is giving me, you know, Santa Claus. So like, (laughs) I can, I can see the doubt in his eyes. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I and I remember when he showed me the book too, and I was like, "Oh, he gave you a Grant Morrison? Oof, he, he's yeah, he's giving you some, he's giving you something good, man. He's giving you something good. Run with it." <laughs> so, Jonathan, what do you hope changes? Uh, like, do, do you want any changes to come out of like this situation with Diamond? Because I feel like this is unfortunately the the event or, or just a circumstance that that the um, industry needed to hopefully take a look at, you know, how things are currently running and uh, critique them. I mean, and granted, retailers such as yourself and shop owners such as yourself, uh, I feel like I've always been vocal. I, I can't name one uh, comic shop owner that I've, that I've been fortunate enough to know that hasn't had some sort of um, comment or, or, you know, diatribe uh, regarding Diamond and how the comic industry, like, runs. Um, I mean, do you think that this is the catalyst that the um, industry needed for change? And, and if so, what does that change look like to you? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, uh, it would be it would be nice to see them, uh, you know, look at, you know, things like the the entire supply chain and printing 
and uh, and see how you know we can potentially be impacted. However, you know at the at the end of the day, it is still comic books, and I don't say that pejoratively. I mean we are we're there for entertainment. It's not like you know getting the milk or the you know mm-hmm. the you know getting the lights on or something. This is something you do as escapism, and certainly now we could all use a little uh, escape of it. But when it all comes back and uh, and we're all going back to normal, it's it's not going to be a, a big thing. I think that there's not a whole lot of you know, despite when you look at like you know Marvel and Warner Brothers, and I tell you, there's not a lot of money to be made in comics. There really isn't. Uh, that because of that, because the margins are the way that they are, um, you're you're not going to see somebody like step up and try to outdo Diamond. And that's the other thing, uh, you know, about this is that, you know, Diamond has these contracts, these quite, uh, you know, attractive contracts with Marvel, DC and other publishers. They have relationships with, uh, you know, with different uh, retailers. And, you know, as much as I would like to have other vendors to potentially, uh, you know, go through and go to on these things. At the end of the day, you know, we're a single, uh, you know, we're a single shop and I think we're a rather average shop, uh, compared to, uh, to some of the other things. And we only have so much time to, you know, process our orders. So, uh, we have to get our orders processed and, and done and, you know, uh, and on the shelves by, by Wednesday. And even at our shop, that, that takes a, a good part of the day of our Tuesday effort mm-hmm. to get that done. If I had to be managing 10 or more, 14 or more different, uh, you know, vendors trying to figure out when, you know, we're going to, you know, when we're going to get our shipment for them, you know, it's like, Oh, I got the DC order, but I didn't get the, you know, I didn't get the Marvel thing. And now, I mean, for good or bad, when, when diamond doesn't ship to me, at least I know where all my books are as opposed to trying to trying to figure out where some of my books are on a day-to-day basis. Um, I think that even, even now there are some, we have some options available to us as far as, uh, you know, different things that are available. Like, uh, uh, we trade paperbacks. You can, you can get those from a lot of different, uh, you know, vendors. Um, but, most retailers don't. Most retailers they they like the simplicity of that. So I mean, mm-hmm. there's a there's a kind of a large entrenched system here that we're we're dealing with that uh, I don't know how much of that uh, we're going to see change because of this. It is it is kind of an extraordinary event that uh, I don't know how much of this you can foresee coming, how much of this you can react to. I mean, I personally would have liked to have seen more of a national reaction back in January when the first case showed up in Washington state, uh, you know, we went from, I mean, if you really want to have some, some horrible fun, but we're at nearly 150,000 uh, people infected here. And this is, you know, towards the end of March, towards the end of January, we had none. And now we're, we're at where we're, we're at where we are with this. It's like, I don't know that this is the clarion call for a wake up and change to the comic book industry as much as it is for, you know, anybody and anything. I mean, we're talking, you're talking about a disease that is largely prevented by washing your hands. Yeah. We're a civilized friggin' nation. We have to tell people to wash their hands. (laughs) I don't know, man. So as much as I'd like to have something out out of this, that's going to, I don't know. fix. That's not even not the right word, but some big lesson to to learn out of this. The so the truth is that I, I don't think that that's what we're gonna we're gonna get. So you might have had the best case for Diamond I've probably ever heard. Normally, I, I don't ever really hear the positive of Diamond in their practices. But um, having worked in a comic shop for, you know, for a short period of time and uh, experiencing like the, you know, that Tuesday, you know, new ordered got in or even, you know, in some cases Wednesday morning having to put all the new comic books up. I can see how right. I can see the negative to because um, you always hear, man, if only there was more options than Diamond, more options than Diamond. But I don't think we ever think about what the con 
of that would look like, even if it's something as, um, uh, even if it's just one thing, such as, you know, well, different shipping dates. I I've, guess I've never heard anyone get, paint diamond, or at least that aspect of diamond in a positive light like you just did. Well, I, I think that there's, you know, not, not just, you know, that aspect of it, of, you know, diamond being a single point of contact, uh, you know, for you for that. But, uh, you know, there's the, I don't know, the people, you know, people just don't like change. They did have, you know, they did have Marvel had their own distributor yep. back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, you know, before they got, you know, before Diamond became, you know, the only choice that we had. There was a there was a time when uh, they had you had other options. And uh, most of the retailers that you talk to from that era will tell you that it was horrible. Yep, that's what I remember. Just the, the whole experience was was horrible. And I, I think I read somewhere where so. even uh, Marvel was like, yeah, we, we suck at this, and it's um, it's d- absolutely devastating as far as, like, when you think about resources and uh, the, the amount of money they were kind of bleeding trying to run their own distribution on top of creating and, and printing, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good little history I mean, uh, fun fact. People often make a comparison, you know, to uh, to grocery stores when they talk about comic books. And, mm-hmm. yep. You know, I, I don't think it's a, a fair comparison in you know a number of ways. You know, like you know, if your if your eggs go bad, you know, then your egg vendor is going to you know swap those out for you. But uh, you know, comic stores don't have you know those options. If I buy too many Batman comics, I better figure out how to. Uh, you know, how to sell those for the, that's pretty much how things for the most part go here is that you're, you're left trying to figure out what to do in these situations with these things. And I, you know, because of, you know, kind of like we were talking about earlier is why doesn't the digital thing just take off? And it's like, it is kind of its own niche thing. It is its own kind of specialty thing as, as far as this goes. And there there are reasons why most of it comes down to the customers, you know, what the, what the customers want out of, out of this whole thing. And, you know, customers don't want these other options. You know, it's not, you're not shipping a, just like a standard commodity, you know, like milk, milk this week is the same as milk next week is milk will always be, Mm -hmm. but you know, you, you don't buy Batman 92 this week and next week and the week after that. You know, you expect there to be 93, and you expect it to be a progression from 92 to 93. And then you expect to buy 94, and a progression from there to that. It's just not the, it's not a, it's not an apples to oranges, uh, you know, sort of uh, comparison. You know, there's a, you're, you're dealing with a whole different level of and kind of product uh, that you have to, to work with and be cognizant of that. Just these other these other supply chain options just aren't you know uh, aren't something there and and I think also it comes down to economy of scale. A lot of this is the Walmart effect uh, is what you're you're seeing with these things. You know why why do I go why why go to the bakery and then the butcher and you know then the home goods store to get something when I could just go to Walmart and get it all. Yeah, it's not as good. Yeah, there's trade-offs that you may be made, but you do those things. And it's the same thing with, you know, the printing and, and whatnot of the comics is like the way of the world is whatever printer that is sh- shut down. I don't know what it is, but I would not be surprised if it services both Marvel and DC. And you know what? And that, that was, is why. That was something I wanted to, to bring up um, while we were on the, while we brought it up a few times as far as the printer Help me understand. I mean, I know Diamond, for the most part, has been considered a, a monopoly when it comes to distributing of, of comic books. But is that the same? Can it be said for for the printer, too? Because the only thing I could find on my end was um, DC's Canadian printer, their main Canadian printer, Transcontinental Printing, um, w- w- right. is shutting down for three weeks. And it, it vaguely in the article mentioned that they also um, service countless other publishers, but they didn't get into detail. Do, I mean, do a majority of these, like your Marvels and some of these other companies, do they all use the same printer? Or is there a, I mean, is there, is there selections on that? <clears throat> I mean, I, I only know of uh, Transcon and yeah. then of a couple in, uh, in uh, like I said, in China. Mm. As far as options, and then some smaller specialty printers, 
uh, here in the in the states. But they, I don't know that the the ones in the in the states could handle uh, the volume of yeah. a Marvel or a, or, or a DC. Hmm. Uh, you know, that's the that's the other thing is that uh, you know when these when these books and and things run. Uh, as far as like another another insight uh, in into these things, you know, books books often get delayed and, and, and things like that. Here we have all the books delayed. Uh, Diamond has a, a feature uh, called uh, well, they they have they ship the books to us on Tuesday if you opt in for that particular choice. Mm-hmm. They've had those books in order to make the shipping deadline or, yeah, in order to make the shipping deadline, they've had those books in their warehouses for over a week. So the book that you're buying, New Comic Book Day, that you're buying on Wednesday has actually been in Diamond's possession usually for two weeks. And that's all so that they can stage, coordinate, pack up the orders and send it to the three, you know, 3,000 or so comic shops that are that are out there so the monopoly the monopoly that they have in the distribution uh and they shudder to call it that but you know between you you, me and the listeners it really does feel like a monopoly Mm -hmm. um some of that comes down to no one else can do the job no one else wants to do the job for the rates uh that would be involved with that um but the i think the real monopolistic part of it is for you know publishers if you know you and the short box crew decided to finally make the short box comic and you wanted to get that into comic shops yeah you could probably hand sell a few to different shops but the way that you really want to do it is you'd want to get it at a distributor like diamond and as much as you know they're shipping comics here they're also controlling to a certain extent the books that get in front of uh, that get in front of customers, and by customers I mean retailers. You know the the real customers, if you will, the the twenty five hundred or so accounts mm-hmm. that are actually buying these. Books. The direct market, and at least their perspective. So, so what can customers do right now to help? I mean, in, in the immediate, and then maybe even when you know things get settled and we're back to our normal you know uh, schedule. What can they? What should they keep in mind from? what's been going on lately and, and some of the precautions and, and things that you guys have had to do to ensure longevity when it comes to their local shop or just the comic industry as a whole. So I guess it's kind of a two part question. How can they help immediately yeah, I and long term? I think what they can do most importantly is to take care of themselves. Uh, you know, make sure that, you know, them, their, their selves, uh, you know, both physically and financially are, you know, in a good place. We don't know how this is, how long this is going to last. Uh, and, you know, as such, it's, it's difficult to make, uh, you know, stern recommendations on things to do and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, however, if you've done those things and let's say that you're in a position like, uh, like you, uh, for example, where this is inconvenient, uh, but it's not going to be financially devastating for you at this point. So, provided that there were comics to buy, you or someone like you in this particular sort of thing could continue to buy your comics, right? Yep. My recommendation to those people, which is the same recommendation I have to almost everybody in any particular thing, is to have a budget. So whatever you're doing on a weekly spend, I mean, you shouldn't be spending all of your free money uh, on comics. So whatever budget you set for yourself, continue to set that money aside. And ideally, if you really wanted to help a, a local comic shop, then you would uh, you'd take that money and purchase gift certificates hmm. that when the shop does reopen, that you could then just – you basically prepaid for your books for the, for the coming months. Um, oh, I mentioned that we're going to start uh, you know, offering our grab bag things. I've heard from some shops that some customers – have started this process and what they're doing is that they're they're buying 20 30 50 100 dollars worth of books and they're not taking them they're saying leave these for new readers leave these for young readers uh that's in 
incredibly sweet and altruistic. And I gotta, I, I gotta be honest with you. The first couple of times I read those stories, I, I got a little, you know, broken up by that. that the beautiful. idea that that is awesome that people were doing, you know, those kind of things. Um, if that's something that's, you know, within within your power, uh, then by all means, uh, you know, do that. At this point, though, it's, uh, you know, you want to be practicing whatever, uh, you know, whatever level your particular local municipality is in. By all means, be following what the, the CDC and the World Health Organization are telling you. If you are unsure about your health, if you have a cough, if you have a fever, well, let's let's invoke the, Stan, the Samuel Jackson here. Stay the fuck home. <laughs> <laughs> Please yeah. stay the fuck home. Um, and, you know, beyond that, yeah, don't be giving your, your comic book retailer hugs or fist bumps or, you know, bringing them food or something. You want to limit the number of people that you interact with, unfortunately, at this time. And, but again, as far as that goes, yeah, if you can, uh, you know, maintain your pool. We've actually, we actually had one customer, you know, uh, reach out to us. It was like, you know, hey, look, I know books are on, uh, you know, on hold, but I really like this one title. Uh, it was uh, God Killers from uh, from Aftershock. He's like, go ahead and put me down for, you know, the rest of the books in that series and send me an invoice for it all and I'll pay you, pay you now. Uh, you know, I'd rather this go to you than anywhere else. Hell yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's in, in, incredibly sweet and thoughtful if you – can if you're in a position to to make those kind of uh you know uh purchases then you know by all means uh do so but you know otherwise you know please just take care of yourselves uh keep yourselves healthy so that when we come out on the other side of this we can all go back to you know business as usual <laughs> Well said, John. Those are those are some fantastic suggestions. I mean, there's definitely some new ones I haven't heard, and, and some of the stories you shared from other shops, man, that's really good suggestions. I appreciate you sharing that insight. Yeah, no problem. Um, John, I want to go ahead and end on a high note, uh, because, you know, I, I mentioned uh, how your, one of your um, uh, uncanny abilities is just really good comic book recommendations. Uh, I want to open it up to you and, and ask what, what are some comics that you would recommend to folks to pick up, whether they be weekly or, or a trade? Uh, well, right now, I think that you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of a trade. And then let me just say why. I've been a, I've been a trade reader for a, a number of years. Uh, I read everything in trade. And up until I had the shop, I really didn't read, uh, you know, any floppies. But uh, having the shop and having the podcast – I read all the new number ones uh, that, that come out and Hey, it's, that was great when they were books coming out every week, but now <laughs> we don't have that trades that that is a gray area uh, that we don't know if we're getting new trades from the publishers, but there's so many existing ones that are already out there and available. And uh, the one that, uh, that really kind of blew my socks off uh, was the uh, the House of X uh, from Jonathan Hickman? Yeah, we, uh, we spoke that very was the twelve on. issues that was done as House and Powers, and came out uh, over twelve weeks. It was uh, such an amazing feat that the book actually shipped on time and and did all of those those great things. But the story itself, when it finally came out, uh, I was able to finally sit down and and read the whole thing, and I was just absolutely floored uh with that and it is the lead-in for all of these new uh, uh x-men books that are coming off all of the the team that he has assembled for the whole dawn of x things are all building on top of that uh if you're looking for something that uh you know maybe isn't uh you know superhero related or dc or marvel uh, Once in Future from Boom Studios so good. is a so good. oh geez yeah. I, I just I just finished it this week. Uh, it was my recommendation on my my latest podcast. It uh, Dan Mora. I mean, you you were mentioning uh, before the uh, the Klaus book. Dan Mora was the artist on that, and I've been since since I first saw Dan's art. I'm like Marvel and DC need to find a project that is just good for you. Dude, absolutely. 
his his stuff is amazing. I actually um, and once in go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say uh, I picked up issue seven last week, and I w- I didn't know there was an issue seven. I was like, wait, there's an issue seven? Hell yes! They, I, I thought it was like oh you know one through six and done, but boy was I excited when I grabbed issue seven last week. Yeah, his his art uh, is just uh, there's a there's a great he oh has a great God, line so style and then the storytelling through mm-hmm. panels. Yep, and I think it's uh, what Tamara Bond villain is doing the the colors on that one, which the I think colorist brings that it out Boom a lot. Studios gets that they tap for these different books. They they almost have a house style mm-hmm. to color over there at Boom. <laughs> well said, yeah, yeah. It that that series once in future makes me j- just from the art alone i'm like yeah i'll probably end up checking out power rangers because i know dan mora um did uh i forget what series for power rangers but i know that he was a penciler on, on that series and i'm like man just yeah he's alone. done some and i i haven't been a i'm not a power rangers fan but you know when it said number one on our or like the annual or something mm-hmm. i've i've read it and i'm like damn this is really good i mean just the the writing is sharp but then it's like you've got somebody like dan mora during yeah. doing the art wow <laughs> I've been reading, uh, I'll go ahead and chime in. I, I've been reading um, on the DC side of the house, I've been reading Starman, uh, the Tony, I'm um, sorry, not Tony. 90s? Yes. Uh, James uh, t- Robinson? Yes, thank you. James Robinson and Tony um, Tony Harris, right? Tony Harris? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been reading Dude, that that's... series, and holy crap, man. But, yeah, everything that I've read about we've it. Been, as retailers, we've been screaming about at DC of like, you know, you need to keep this. This is the kind of book that you need to perpetually keep in print because and, it is it is almost evergreen. It is just amazing, dude. And and I, I didn't know what because I just started reading on the um, the DC Universe app. They finally put um, they're finally trying to like you know bulk up their uh, their comic offerings and selection. And I keep forgetting I have that app. So I was like, well, let me go ahead and read this to make you know get some value out of this app that I keep paying for. Um, and I've always heard the stellar recommendations and just the praise when it comes to that series. I mean, even, you know, Drew has, has, has championed it so many times. What I didn't know was how hard it was to get in physical form. I know they've got a few, like, you know, yeah. oversized hardcovers and omnibuses. But to your point, like, everything I read was like, dude, we keep asking, like, DC, like, to, to release this in a physical format on a regular basis because they just don't. That is That is one. I've talked about that on my podcast of – of uh, how, you know, DC really, uh, especially in light of Dan Didio uh, living, leaving, you know, and, and, you know, despite how, you know, people may or may not feel about Dan, you know, there were definitely some, some things that happened under his tenure that, uh, you know, I don't think were great for us as retailers or fans. And one of those being that DC has just an absolutely incredible Marvel too, incredible back catalog Mm -hmm. of material. And when you have some of these uh, just real gemstones uh, to, to work with and they start like, I think, I think Starman is something like nine volumes in trade. And it's like, okay, we're going to start here. It is a new printing. Here's number one. Here's two. We're soliciting three. We're canceling three. What the hell, dude? You know, it's like, what do you want from me? I was mean, like, yeah. give me time. I mean, because some of these things you have to hand sell. Like you say, you know, you, you know, people have been talking to you. You have to finally discover and, and mm-hmm. try it. It's like, what does it hurt? Especially once, you know, everybody who reads it loves it and goes out and continues to evangelize it. It's a little bit of investment on their part to print and store, but eventually we're going to sell those. Yeah. We're, we're going to, you know, we're going to sell those, print them. If you if you print them, they will sell. <laughs> not immediately, not this month, but eventually, yes. I mean, this is this is one of the things you have to take a you, have, you take a look at uh, Image Comics. You know, almost every Image title that you can think of when you talk about good Image titles, hot Image titles, is still in print. Mm-hmm. Some of that has to do with the fact that Image is a creator owned company, and it's in you know their best interest, the creator's best interest, to keep it in print. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they, they still, you know, I can still go get Walking Dead Volume 4. You know, what happens to that? Uh, there's a bunch of people that are trying to get away from zombies. What does it matter? It's the fourth one in a 32-issue, hmm. uh, you know, 
set of trade paperbacks still in print. I mean, you name one, it's in print. And then the other series I finally have started as well, when it, when it comes to like, you know, me taking my sweet ass time to hop on these critically acclaimed books, um, Astro City. I have become oh, man. fully enamored with Astro City. And I got to <laughs> I got to thank um, a good friend and a listener of the show, um, uh, oh, Wade, uh, for selling me the first volume and the third volume. Um, and I'm going to pick up volume two here soon. But uh, man, it is absolutely solidified. Kurt Busaic as if he's not my favorite writer, he's definitely in my top three. Like that series is absolutely mind blowing. It is so good. It is so it it just captures the the magic of superhero comics for me and just comics in general. But but mainly just like my love of capes and and, and superhero antics and things like that. It is such a well thought out series. When it came to uh, comic books and comic book meta history, I always thought, you know, uh, Mark Wade was the gold Dude, standard ditto. Uh, for ditto. that. And if you read Kingdom Come, certainly, you know, mm-hmm. he, he is. But I think Busack, with what he's done there with Astro, Astro City, you know, you can tell that he loves superhero comics. He understands superhero comics. And in Astro City, he just takes everything for superhero comics and mashes it in there. There's a Fantastic Four story. There's a Superman story. There's a Batman story. There's a yeah. Captain America yep, story. Yep. It's not with any of those names or titles, but it's got all those things there. And then you remember that Busiak is the same guy that wrote Marvels for Marvel, mm-hmm. which was a- an absolute excellent rival to Kingdom Come as far as a, you know, a meta look at the history of, you know, of comic books and mashing it all together and still telling a compelling story. Busiak knows what's up. The art in it doesn't hurt either. No, not at all. I, I won't lie. I wasn't the biggest because I, I remember I remember seeing these these uh, covers and Wizard and things like that when I first started collecting. Um, but I forgot that Alex Ross doesn't do the interior. Is Brent Anderson doesn't and, do the interiors? No. And no. I wasn't the biggest fan when I started reading the, the the beginning issues of Astro City. But by the time I got done with Volume One. I could not imagine anyone else doing Astro City. Like I was like, nope, Brent yeah. Anderson completely won me over. Um, and speaking about Astro City and what go, what Busiak has done there is is so good. Like I said, he's he's you know doing a pastiche or he's aping the uh, the different uh, you know archetypical characters mm-hmm. that you know uh, you know I would if you're looking for you know a good Wonder Woman story or you're looking for a good you know whatever story. You know, I would also I would I would put some of these uh, you know some of these books into the running uh, for for looking at that. You know, hmm. the uh, what is God? It's not Promethea. What is what oh, is uh, the, the the Wonder Woman stand in the wing, uh, winged Victor or winged winged glory something like that? Yeah, uh, victory. Though she is, you know, if you're looking for a good Wonder Woman story. Any t- any arc where she's at the center of it, that's an excellent Wonder Woman story. It's not mm. Wonder Woman, but it is still an excellent Wonder Woman story. Yeah, and and speaking about uh, you, you brought up um, Marvels and uh, Mark Wade, who Mark Wade I think still has my number one spot for favorite writer of all time. But um, mm-hmm. I recent I've recently purchased the um, I, even though I had all of these in single issues, I was picking these up on a weekly basis. I went ahead and bought, anyways, the um, the trade, the collected trade of the history of the Marvel Universe, and I don't yes. think I, the I don't Treasury think, Edition, one. dude. Oh my God, it's so nice. Like d- just aside from the 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 format that they went with that you know Treasury Edition format, so all the pages are much uh, yeah. bigger, um, which makes you know Javier Rodriguez's art just like absolutely pop. Just that, pop. That is just one of the absolutely pop. That is one of the funnest information dense books i have ever read and i cannot like i i keep recommending it to people and everyone's like so wait a minute this is uh a thesaurus you're, you're, you're like, making me read a live action wikipedia yeah, yeah. article what the hell man <laughs> <laughs> yeah i keep I, as a matter of fact i think i might have recommended it to brian and he was like i i think i'm gonna hold off on that one just yet but for me it's like dude the way he mark wade easily just navigates all of these just aspects of the Marvel universe, and not just characters, but like you know certain um, uh, uh, 
entities and like um, uh, organizations and just history within the Marvel universe and, and just elegantly, like very effortlessly, like, you know, one caption box, you know, with two or three sentences and he just keeps it moving and it's all really well connected. I mean, it, it's definitely probably one of my favorite purchases of the year and it just solidified just when I thought Mark Wade, you know, was, was starting to, you know, uh, fade out. It's like nah, he he still got it. If you if he really wanted yeah. to, he could easily just show you why he's the master at this. Um, and then uh, the whole Marvels thing, Marvel. God damn it, Marvel! They started re-releasing all those. I guess Kurt Busey. They got Kurt Busey roped in, and Alex Ross roped in for all of these um, Marvels and Marvel uh, re-release comics. So they've got me roped in with those. Yeah, the snapshot ones. Yeah, well, and that's my only gripe is there's too many of them to keep track. There's Marvel snapshots. Yes. And then there's Marvel, so it's just like the you know classic Marvels, but minus the S and more of an anthology story. And then I know they're do- working on a Marvel, the Marvels project. So it's like uh, th- the naming convention could be much better to avoid all this confusion. And I don't know if I need three to four different titles of practically the same concept, an anthology story. <laughs> but that's Marvel for you. Yeah, so. we're, we're doing this the same thing at the shop. Is we're you know putting it together. It's like okay, come on. <laughs> and then you know they've got their their kind of their more all ages line that they're doing with uh, with IDW in partnership with IDW, and in all of those it's Marvel. So Marvel's classic Avengers, Marvel's oh, Black God. Black Panther, Marvel's Captain Marvel. I mean, it's like twice in one in one title. Come on, guys! <laughs> it's like we get it. We know who you are. Yeah, John Jonathan. It's been yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. This has been a fun conversation. Oh uh, um, yeah, this is. I, f- I gotta be honest with you, man. This brightened my day. Yeah, I, it, I really appreciate you uh, reaching out. Yeah, man. I like I said when 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 I thought about the topic, and you know, we were getting questions, and and it definitely, I just kind of saw the impact it was the, of the Diamond News was having on our listeners and like my close friends, and it, just myself too. I was like, man, I, I got to do an episode about this. It, it would, you know, it would, we would be behooved if we did not do an episode. And when I started thinking about, okay, who can I have on the show that can you know, accurately, honestly, and and also entertain while talking about such a heavy topic. There was no hesitance. I was like, nope, Jonathan's got to get on this call. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad I said yes. I mean, with that kind of send up, I'm now wondering, it's like, what if I had said no? (laughs) What if I'm just like, oh, dude, I'm just too depressed. I can't even think about it now. I would have had this. You know, bought it like, well, Fuck! Who's my B two? Who's my? You know, yeah, I would have. I would have. Like, you don't understand, dude. I need you to do this. No, I, I think. I think. I. I know. Honestly, you know. I. I know that was a joke, but I think I did. I needed to hear from someone that is is dealing with this at that at that retailer level, uh, at that businessman level, and and you know, give me some reassurance. And and I think you did the job really well, not only for myself, but I, I want to say for our listeners too, by being honest and and. And I mean, you weren't trying to sugarcoat it. And I think you just, you're kind of in the same boat as us, it seems like. It's still a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot more questions um, on both sides of the house. And everyone's kind of taking it as it comes. Yeah, I mean, I I really, I've gotten, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten questions from people about, you know, well, what can you tell me about, uh, oh boy, uh, you know, San Diego Comic Con? And I'm like, um, Uh, I don't know how connected you think I am. I mean, (laughs) I do belong to something called the Marvel Secret Retailer Group, but it's just called that. Yeah. I mean, there's no secrets. There's, and Marvel just likes to, as we just discussed, likes to call everything Marvel. So, I mean, I don't have really anything, you know, in any insightful thing. I mean, the only thing I've got is just me being me and just, you know, looking at the numbers and things. And, you know, when, when the president said, Oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to be back to business by, by normal, by uh, Easter, uh, you know, by April 15th. And I'm like, um, have you talked to anybody in your administration or anything? Cause you know, that's just not the way it works. I mean, that's, that's the, the unfortunate thing is you, know, you, you have to come to a certain amount of peace with it. I mean, I, I don't want to get, you know, dire or anything, but mm-hmm. it is, it is like death in a way in that you don't make the rules for that. You don't dictate the terms. This is their terms and this is just the way that works. And mm. I mean, right now, unfortunately it is a, you know, it is a Corona uh, world and we just live in it. And I think as long as we don't try to force it into and make it do things, I mean, that's, that's my biggest concern is that we try to come back from this too early and, you know, you make it worse by doing that. Um, 
well, you know, we, we learn from the numbers and just take deep breaths, you know, provided you're without, you know, farther than six feet from somebody, <laughs> uh, take deep breaths, calm down. It's, we're going to, we're going to get through this, uh, you know, it's, it's just going to take time. And when it's all done, some shops may close, you know, my shop may close. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how long it'll, it'll, it'll last, but comic books as a whole is not going away. You know, if, if my shop's closed, someone else, somebody else, I don't know, maybe, maybe some podcaster in Riverside of Jacksonville will take up the call and someone else will open a shop, you know? So even if, some shops don't make through it. The industry is still going to be there. Our stories are still going to be told. People are still going to be able to collect these stories. People are still going to be able to enjoy comics the way that they have. You know, just it might be just a little different. Thank you, John. That was that was, that was really well said. And look, man, you've got. I, I know you know people say you know uh, uh, you know thoughts and prayers don't really amount to anything. But look, man, you've got my best wishes, the positive energy, whatever I can I can I can give to, to you know hopefully see you guys. Um, on the other side of this, um, definitely that would be devastating if anything happened to your shop or any of the local shops here that I, I love frequenting. Um, you know, I, you got my heart, man. You got my my thoughts and, and the heart out there. Yeah, I want I want all of us to to come through this. You know, you know, still hale and hearty, and uh, you know, able to enjoy things the way they are. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody uh, again in person when this is when this is all over so well the other question people ask me a lot about is you know free comic book day when's that happening well it's not happening in may my personal hope is that we have it in october where we normally would have had halloween comic fest we combine halloween comic fest and free comic book day and we have it the last saturday in uh in october Let's start lobbying for that now. Let's people all who can, you know, work together so that we can have that. And that means doing those things that you're supposed to do. Wash your hands, stay away from people, you know, stay at home if you're sick. Do these things so that we can get together in October and have free comic book day. Because who the fuck doesn't love free comic book day? Six years of doing it, I've never seen a sad face at free comic book day. Damn right. Damn. All right, I'm I'm hyped. All right, I'm pumped. All right, let's go. Come on, um, Jonathan. <laughs> Do with, this. With hey, that, let's get back to waiting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's go to wash these hands. Damn it. Yeah. Uh, let's wash the hell out of these hands. <laughs> Jonathan, where can people find you when all of this shit cools down and shops are back to running business, man? Where can people find you and where can people listen to you? More importantly. Uh, best thing to start is start with goalter.com. You know, from there you can find uh, the address to our shop in Orange Park. Uh, you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter. I'm still trying to work out that whole Instagram thing, man. You're gonna have to you have to give me a lesson on how to Insta properly. I just feel I might be too old for it. Uh, <laughs> nah, but you I also find links to our podcast there. Uh, recorded one uh, yesterday, and I'm honestly, you know, given that we're you know largely dependent on. Uh, you know, new books each week. I'm not sure what we're doing, uh, you know, coming forward. It could just be a bunch of recommendations and me ranting, which I don't, I can't imagine anybody would really enjoy that. I wouldn't enjoy that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can find uh, links to our past shows, including, you know, the shows that we did together uh, with the, uh, the, the hip hop stuff. I was again, listening to that one, uh, those, those series of episodes uh, a week or so ago and, but man, those really stand up. Yeah, those are fun. Shout out to Scott. Oh yeah, Zane. Zane is the man. Yeah. Um, with, well, with that being said, uh, listeners, that is the end of our show. I once again want to thank uh, Jonathan Bates and the whole Altered Egos Comics uh, crew uh, for this episode, for the, for his time, uh, for answering our questions and talking about you know what could have easily been a very morbid conversation, but you know in, in true short box and just comic book fashion, man, hope hope prevailed, hope prevailed and came out. Hopefully, you guys, you had a good time, a fun time, and a, an insightful time too. Uh, you heard the recommendations by Jonathan uh, regarding what you can do to support your local comic shop as well as not only yourselves, uh, but, you know, the industry as a whole when we come out of this. So uh, take heed, and um, we'll catch you guys next week. Uh, we'll have our Frank Frazetta Artist Spotlight episode to keep you guys busy and occupied. Until then, peace, 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 peace.